All right, everybody. Welcome to the Open Grants webinar on tips, tips for grant writing. Super excited to have you all here and extra stoked to have Meredith Noble from learngrantwriting.org with us as well. I'm going to let Meredith introduce herself in just a quick second, but a few housekeeping things really quickly. Um, as you as you come on, um, there's going to be a couple opportunities during this webinar to engage. Um, there gonna, there's going to be a poll that we're going to run pretty early on to talk, um, to just get some feedback about where you are in your kind of grant funding strategy and grant writing process. Um, and then after the webinar, we would love your feedback on what you found valuable. Um, so there'll be a survey afterwards, if you could please respond to that. Um, as we're talking today and having this great discussion, definitely feel free to use the Q&A uh, tool um, in the webinar to voice your, voice your questions and we'll address those as possible. Um, and certainly if we can't get to it today, our team will reach out in our follow-up and we'll include some, some follow-up on those. So really excited to have you all here. Thank you so much. Open Grants is the easy way to win grant funding. And I'm just going to go ahead and um, let Meredith from learngrantwriting.org introduce herself and a little about, about her awesome organization. Hi, everybody. It's so great to be here. I wasn't prepared to give my bio, and I figure you already read something about me, so I thought I would give you something a little more fun. I grew up a fifth generation cattle rancher in Wyoming, the oldest of four girls. So while I might not look like it in business attire today, I actually am most happy when I'm out on the tractor or on a horse. So there's the, you know, the other side of the person love green tea and usually reside in Alaska, where my co-founder, Alexandra Lustig, who's on the line as well, and I have started learngrantwriting.org where we help women, mostly men as well, that are burnt out in their careers, learn how to become grant writers. And we do this through an online community group. So that's the quick and dirty version of Meredith Noble in a nutshell. Beautiful, thank you so much. And you know, one of the things that you, probably know about Meredith if you got a chance to, to look her up. Um, she actually also wrote two incredible books. Um, oh, yeah. So she is definitely up here. <laughs> yes. So I actually, uh, is that this, is that the new one? I can't really. Uh, yeah, it's the new one. I just I got my, some more copies recently. So I'm pretty excited about it. I flagged a couple chapters for the, today's conversation. Very cool. So super excited to talk a little bit about that. And just, you know, just to give you a little quick background, when we were building open grants, we were Googling around to find out who was, you know, we have this marketplace of grant writers who do all kinds of, you know, provide all kinds of great uh, services to our users. And we were looking around for like who was educating and like trying to organize this industry and set the standard. And we really found like Meredith and the company she was building were just like, they were the ones like setting, you know, out there setting the standard, um, helping organize this space. So we're really excited to talk uh, a little bit about learn grant writing. And I know you kind of mentioned sort of what it is and what it is you do, but, you know, clearly, you know, really, you're a really talented person. You've written books, you've done all these cool things. What is it about kind of grant funding that like makes you excited? Like there's a lot of things you could be working on. Why, uh, why grant funding? Yeah, absolutely. Such a great question. I fell into grant writing. Uh, it was an, an accident. And I think that's a really common story. I imagine there's some people listening right now that are nodding like, yep, I just got thrust into it and had to figure it out. A little sink or swim, right? So I started freelancing after college, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I started writing grants for an engineering firm. And I just rolled up my sleeves and started to figure it out. Fast forward, uh, I started writing grants. I was the full-time grant writer for this you know, global engineering firm, helping our clients get infrastructure grants. And what I love about it is that Frankly, you're simply the most interesting person at a dinner table because you are dangerously knowledgeable about a lot of different topics without actually being a subject matter expert, right? <laughs> so yeah. I think that's what I enjoy <laughs> about it. It's just if you like project-based work, not doing the same thing over and over, grant writing is a good fit. I love it. Awesome. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I definitely, you know, similarly fell, fell into it and then quickly realized that it was really hard. It was a lot of work. And so I was like, yeah, I should just build some really cool tools and help, you know, kind of like bring these cool people together with these cool projects because I just, you know, like I don't really particularly find the work of grant writing super awesome. Um, it's, you know, it's so cool to find people who can get into it and really dissect these things 
and tell these incredible stories. Um, I have, you know, I have deep respect and appreciation for the skill, um, having, you know, turned my hand at it a few times and en enjoyed some success, but certainly uh, very cognizant of all of the work and kind of craft that goes into, um, you know, being, being this, uh, playing this role in an effective way. Yeah. Um, so I think Go it's ahead. a bit of a misnomer. I think people think you have to love writing. And I actually was not a very good writer when I started. And it takes a lot of effort for me to sit down and focus and write. Yet when you get to the other side of that and you can read it and touch it, like, you know, the, a book is basically a big grant application. Mm -hmm. It's it's so rewarding. So I think sometimes that's part of it is like, you, you have to like, there's other parts of this that make it super satisfying that aren't always what you think you have to have to enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, I 100% agree. So, you know, I think one of the things that we're obviously like the main topic for the day is, you know, tips for uh, grant funding strategy and kind of diving into that space. Um, I, I guess we're going to start with the basics of, you know, what is a grant funding strategy? Like, what does that mean? And if you could share maybe a little bit of you know, how you teach it or, or what, what kind of things people can expect if they were to, for example, go through your training or your courses? Yeah, great question. Okay, so a funding strategy, here's the simple definition. It is a roadmap of the top grants to pursue that represent the highest likelihood of success and return on investment. It is stopping the process of chasing grants haphazardly, right? And it's getting very intentional about what you pursue. How this process came to be is that I was thrust into some very complicated projects trying to figure out how to fund multi-million dollar endeavors and realizing one grant was not going to get it done. I needed to know how to layer multiple grants together and what is the strategy between who comes first and who comes last and maybe non-grant funding sources that have to close the, the deal here. So the funding strategy process really emerged out of necessity of zooming out to figure out how to fund an entire project and then you can go into actually deploying that but I think often we just go right into deploying and we're missing that bigger picture story so yeah. reasons why an organization would need one I'm sure people have their reasons that they're thinking off the top of their heads right so I mean the obvious one increase your win rate boom that's worth it <laughs> Prevent yourself or your staff from burning out. It's preserving resources. So you actually do what you love to do. If you're like Sadal and don't actually love grant writing, right? Uh, forces you to level up your game. You get alignment all the way from the board or the executive director or CEO down, right? That's huge. Um, it just simply is a good use of our time because like life is short. So why would you spend it chasing a grant? You have no chance of winning, right? So we want to just do the things that we actually think are going to yield great results and, and write the grants that win, right? Yeah, 100%. It makes so much sense. And I love, you know, the idea, the, like the paradigm shift of just being intentional, right? It's something that I think a lot of people have started to think about and try to do in many aspects of their life. And this is just one of like, you know, creating yeah. this incredible organizational efficiency by being intentional about what you're going out and doing. And I think, when you expand that concept, it makes perfect sense, right? It's like, oh, I should be in, you know, we should be intentional. It's something that I think a lot of human beings in general aspire to be or, or to do and find clarity and like purpose in doing that. And so this is like applying that kind of intentionality to your kind of organizational approach to raising funding, which makes all the sense in the world. Um, do you exactly. feel like, like everyone needs one or is this something that just like a nonprofit needs or like it, you know, is this for everybody or is it just for like a few people? It's just for you and me. No, I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Okay. So I, like I said, so I deployed this for infrastructure projects. So that was everything from city governments to state governments. So there you have it. We're not just talking nonprofits, done a lot of work with tribes, uh, business accelerators, and then of course for nonprofits. So if it has to do with grant funding in any capacity, this model applies and is relevant. Beautiful. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and posit uh, a, question, a few questions out to the audience to maybe kind of take the temperature of the room in terms of where y'all are in your yeah. process. So there's gonna be a quick poll we're gonna deploy here. Um, and yeah, please go ahead and respond to that. 
um, just let us know kind of where you're at and what kind of things you're working on right now. Um, and, and while you're doing that, I'm just gonna take a quick look at some of the, some of the questions we're getting in. Um, lots, of great, uh, lots of great questions. Thank you all for responding to the poll as well. Um, one of the, a couple that I'm just gonna address real quick. Um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of our answers in this space are like, it depends, right? So like, one of the questions I see Meredith typing an answer to is, you know, how much time does it take to get a grant from, from applying to getting money? And I'm sure Meredith has a similar answer, but a lot of times it just kind of depends on who you're working with. Um, also some basic housekeeping that I think will address a few things. Um, yes, this webinar will be recorded and published. We'll send it out to your email that you registered with. Um, if you opted into that communication by registering with us, then you'll get a um, then you'll get an email with this update. Um, and some of these we will uh, dive into a little bit later. But um, another another one here, um, we will be publishing this recording on YouTube with Open Grants, um, and then we'll certainly also be providing a copy of this to the Learn Grant Writing team. And I'm sure I don't know Meredith if you all have a, a YouTube channel. A, yeah, awesome. we do. Awesome. Yes. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> beautiful. So yeah, we'll throw that stuff. We'll throw that stuff out there um, as we uh, kind of record and edit this. So thank you so much for responding to the poll. You know, uh, seeing a lot of good feedback. It seems like one of the top things that people are struggling with or challenges they're facing is just finding the right grant opportunities. And if that is the case, then you are a hundred percent in the right place. And then the next top thing is creating a strategy, which, you know, doubling down, like I, the one really helps and answers the other. Uh, I think Meredith will agree with me on that point that, you know, if you want to have a better time finding the right opportunities, being intentional about it and building a strategy will help you with that. So I'm going to go ahead, we'll, we'll cool. do some more answers and kind of Q&A um, a little bit later, but wanted to kind of um, off of that, uh, off of that poll, um, definitely wanted to uh, kind of address a bit, um, and I'll go ahead and just share these results with the with the, the audience here. Yeah, um, I hope everyone can see that. I mean, we're covering eighty percent of what most people are facing, and then hopefully we can get the other ones in the questions. So everybody's yeah. at the right webinar today. <laughs> yes, you are. Yeah, it's very exciting. We're so excited to have you all here. Um, so let's let's talk about finding the right grant opportunities that's yeah. that's the next thing we were going to discuss anyways um we talk about and you know I, i've enjoyed bits and pieces of your book i've listened to the podcast of your book on spotify which was fun times um and you talk a bit about like a funnel um and and how you get to like finding these the proper grant opportunities can you kind of elaborate on that a bit for for the audience Oh yeah, <laughs> you betcha. Okay, so <laughs> when I do like to think of it as a funnel. So I'm really glad you remember it that way because when you begin a new project and you're trying to figure out what should I be even going after, you might look at hundred plus grant opportunities, which is a great problem to have, right? That there's all of these grants out there, but as we all know, all grants are not equal. So in this stage, it's about being super creative and filling the top of that funnel with any possible grant opportunity, no matter how harebrained it might seem and unrelated, we're going to just put it in the top of the funnel and see if it fits. I think I could use an example. Can I give an example real quick? So it might make, please, this make yeah. more sense. Okay, yeah, please do. Okay. So I used to work with Canton Russell. He's a former ex-pro skateboarder turned skate park designer. And so I was helping him get skate parks funded all over the U S. And if you were to just search skate park funding, you will find pretty much one thing, the Tony Hawk Foundation, yeah. <laughs> which the average grant amount is $10,000 and the average skate park is at least 2 million. So you can see the problem, right? So what I would instead, and I was thinking about whenever I would work on those projects are things like, what are the adjacent land uses? I had a project that had a local lake that was nearby that had water quality issues. So a big part of a skate park is the civil infrastructure, the site plan. So, hey, could the parking lot have permeable pavement? Could we have inform, inform, you know, informational signage about water quality, right? <laughs> Things like that. 
there was a senior center that was actually getting built right next door to the same same project. And so I thought, okay, how can we bridge maybe, um, you know, senior and our town's young people? There are some interesting grants for senior seniors and shading, right? Mm -hmm. So we could maybe put some seating in. Then what about community health, skateboarding, BMX, biking? That's a sport. Uh, this is also kind of gross, but it's true. Is there any legacy soil contamination? We had a, did a project up in uh, Rochester, New York, and it was under, they were going to put the skate park under a freeway, basically, so it had cover, but it was a pretty contaminated and a dirty site. But the upside of a big bowl and all of this cement is that it actually caps it as right. a, a way of solving that problem. <laughs> so if, if you get what I'm doing here, I'm thinking about it from a lot of different angles that have actually nothing to do with skate parks directly. And mm -hmm. if you're thinking to yourself, listening to this, I am not that creative. How will I come up with those ideas? My biggest tip on this process is get your budget and go line by line. And then you can think about it a little bit differently when you see just the specific line item instead of the whole thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's, that's a great point. And I, to kind of double down on that, I think uh, often we as people who maybe don't spend a lot of time in a foundation or in the government, um, we tend to think of our, and, and this just happens anywhere, I, you know, if you're coming at a problem or from a, a point of passion or, or whatever, you're thinking about it in the lens that you are approaching it, which is like state right. park. Um, and what's mm -hmm. important to consider is that there is so much money out there for so many different things. And because a lot of this stuff is related, you know, one of the things that we helped a company with recently is they do cybersecurity work. And while there's not necessarily a ton of grants for like government to purchase cybersecurity, they don't come out that way. It's about like securing ports or securing cities. So mm -hmm. if you're just searching for cybersecurity, you might find the odds and ends, but if you search for securing X, Y, and Z, and then you think about the myriad ways that you might secure that place, cybersecurity happens to be one of them. And, and so it's a lot about just, um, and I, I love that like budget idea of pulling out each budget item and thinking about it that way. Um, and then there's also just, you know, you, you can have the opportunity to pull together other stakeholders who might have different lenses about how exactly. that impacts the community. Um, as you're having meetings with people who are working on your project, invite them to talk about like the things they're working on and you might get some great ideas from them as well, because there is so much, other, so many other impacts. Um, you could talk about economic development. You could talk about growth. You can talk about, you know, even like um, housing infill, uh, all, all these kinds of things um, that might exactly. be involved in a project. So yeah, this is a, it's a great point. So that's, that's top of the funnel. You're like building all these opportunities out. Um, and then you like, then you have a filtering process that you talk about of kind of like getting down to that next stage. Um, what, what does that look like? So you've gone, you've, you've had your creative visions or you've done your budget line item exercise and you've got like 200 grants or maybe 30. Um, what does that like second stage look like? Absolutely. Okay. So we're in, we've already in stage one of the funnel. Now we're moving to stage two of the funnel. And this is where you go from hundred plus grant opportunities to the top 20 or so. And the way I like to whittle this list down is to think about three questions. So this is the only three questions everyone needs to remember. What is the funders past giving history? Where do they give grants and what will they fund? So I'm going to break those down and say them again. So everyone can catch that. So what is the funders past giving history? The best indication of future giving is past giving, right? So if they've actually only given grants in the state of New York and you're in California, swipe it from the list, right? So just quick power moving here. We're not getting stuck in going down rabbit holes. We are looking for the, to answer those three questions and boogie, right? So that's helpful. Uh, then like, where do they give like, the other thing I guess that's helpful about like what's their past giving history like is what's the award size and the total amount. So a resource that we like is just even checking out grantmakers.io. There's a lot of interesting resources online for reviewing 990 data for those of you that are looking at foundations. Uh, but you can also do this when you look at past federal grants, like who have they actually awarded grants to. Go and look at, they say they award grants up to 5 million, but what are they actually giving? And you might find, oh, they actually really just make awards for a million. So you know that's 
what you would need to be applying for, right? So it's just an easy party trick to keep in your toolbox. And then in terms of what will they fund, uh, that's just like a high level question, not going full, full depth on eligibility, but it's saying, if they say they don't fund a capital infrastructure project, and that's what you're trying to get funded, remove it from the list, right? So the whole point here is to work super quick and dirty, like boogie, 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 do not, like you need to set timers so you don't waste time on this. And it's just about keep or out, keep or out. And then when we go to stage three, we can actually analyze the ones that you like more closely. So does that make sense? Yeah, that's awesome. I think okay. uh, another um, thing that I just want to throw out there, you know, uh, you mentioned grantmakers.io and you mentioned kind of like, uh, so on the federal side, uh, yeah, on the foundation side, those are, there's great places, grantmakers.io. The bigger foundations also have repositories of the grants they've awarded. In mm -hmm. fact, that's frequently what you will find on their website when you go search for grants is like, this is what we've, this is what we've awarded to people in the past. Um, so just be aware that on the federal side, even though they may seem imposing, typically the government is required on some level to give you information about the uh, about their program. So if you can figure out, um, and usually it should just be uh, some basic kind of work to go ask the question. Um, if you can figure out what they've you know what they've funded in the past, you typically can just ask them. Say, hey, can you email me all of like your past awardees? And they'll send you a zip file of like everything and you can look through it real quick. So um, just on the federal side, be aware that sometimes while the information might not be as available, it is out there and typically they're supposed to just tell you. So you can just ask. Um, totally. and exactly. They should give you the answer. And if they mm -hmm. don't, then, then you can ask again. Um, so yeah, that's great. Well, I love it. So let's keep going down the funnel. What comes next here? Okay, so the third stage of the finite funnel is the hardest and takes the most amount of time and critical thinking skills because this is when you're actually making the go no go decision on what are those handful of grants that we're actually going to allocate time and money and resources to go after, right? So this is this is you know picking those grants that have the highest likelihood of winning. So there's a couple of key tricks and things that you need to be applying when you're in this stage, going from 20 grants to the top, like three to five that you're focusing on this year. So first, like first, first thing you do before you do anything else, it's almost like two point, stage 2.5, it's right in between them, is checking the competitiveness. So you check the competitiveness of a grant by dividing the total number of applicants by the number that were funded. So if you only have a 3% chance of winning, it doesn't matter if you have a perfect grant because someone else is going to also have a perfect grant. So my general rule of thumb is striving for a 20% chance or greater. Obviously it's whatever, you know, if it's 18%, so be it, right? I'm not being like really rigid on that, but we certainly just want decent odds to work with just knowing what you're putting into this. And I know some of you, I'm, I'm like waiting for the question to come up. Maybe it is, not yet, let's see. How do you actually find out the number of applicants? It's not like that's posted online. So you have to email the funder, which is a very nice way to sort of open a door without having to go further in the door. It's like, just put your foot in the door. You don't have to go in the door. Just say, hello, I'm just reaching out, trying to understand how competitive this grant program is. Could you tell me how many applied last year versus how many were funded? Just looking for a ballpark figure here get that email back and then you know, okay, cool. I can proceed and continue to investigate this or boom, it's out and it's I'm not looking at it anymore. So that's a big, big trick. Um, the second one I would say, probably the second tip would be creating a, what we call in our program, a power prospectus. So this is a one page overview of what you do, uh, who the problem you're solving, who you're doing that for, what it's going to cost, and why you want to partner with that organization. And it's a very good exercise to go through anyway, because a lot of times our ideas have never actually been dialed down to one page, and that's an activity in and of itself, right? And what's nice is you can then send that power prospectus to the funder you want to have a serious conversation with ahead of asking for a meeting. And then they can review it very quickly, understand what you're doing. And you're not going to waste all this time when you do get them on the phone telling them what you do, right? Like 
why burn? That's not helping you learn anything. You know what you're doing. So I'll keep that and preserve that needing time to actually learn and ask questions versus burning through it, talking about yourself. So the power prospect is also is very professional and sets you apart from the pack. That's just useful on many fronts. Um, yeah, I, do, I have other tips, but did you have any you wanted to add? Oh, I just want to, I just want to double down on the, the concept of like the power perspective is, is, uh, is hugely beneficial. And I think that frequently um, folks in the space um, sometimes make the mistake of not engaging funders yes. ahead of time, like sufficiently, or sometimes they don't do it at all, which always boggles my mind, but definitely like talk to these people. There's no rule that says you can't. Um, and, and frankly, you know, if you were, if you kind of think about it, like a sales relationship, you don't want to just cold call someone with a grant application. Cause that's like months of work. It's so much time and energy. And if you just send it in, you know, they don't even know who you are. So what, you know, why would they give you any money? Um, you yep. want to like build these relationships and be strategic about how you approach them. Um, there's a lot of great tools for doing this, but I, I think that the tool is really irrelevant to the point of like communicate, build the relationship up um, and, you know, make sure you're taking that first step because if you just like cold call them with an application, chances are you just were not, you're not going to get funded. Like that's like the probability was already low yeah. and, and you just made it lower. <laughs> so I literally have data to back this up. So this is in chapter 10 in the book. It's a new chapter in the second edition. And I will never forget this quote from a funder. I'm going to read it. Nothing is worse than getting a cold application and not knowing where it came from, even if it is perfectly written. Boom, mic drop. Like, it's so yeah. true. I think we get so nervous about sometimes people get really nervous about reaching out, maybe from fear of rejection or whatever. But really, like they want to know you want to know what's coming down the pipeline and not be surprised. Yep. Yeah, 100 um, percent. I think, you know, this has been really great. I want to make sure we dive into some of these questions really quick because I think yeah I'm relevant. seeing some I think I should hit like De uh, Denise is asking can you repeat what the power prospectus consists of that's an easy one for me to hit real quick yeah okay so yeah, let's do a quick recap here hit some questions then I'll, I'll hit a few go for it okay cool so so Denise to answer your question uh though Alex is typing in an answer thank you Denise or Alex for doing that um but it would be who is your organization what problem are you solving who do you serve What's it going to cost? Like, what do you need funding for? Be clear on that. And um, how are you measuring success? And why do you want to work with them? And some sort of call to action. Like, if you're interested in supporting this project or whatever, like, put some contact info, right? One page. All right, hit me. What do you have for other Love questions? Um, there's another one here that I think, you know, we're, we're kind of getting to the eligibility bit. So I'll throw yeah. this one at you real quick. Um, the, the question says, how do you select grants that best matches with the company's mission and value to win? And I think eligibility kind of rolls into that well. So if you wanted to talk about that real quick, that'd be awesome. Yeah, so to answer that, that question is in stage two of the funding funnel. So that's actually the previous one. That's when you're looking at what's their past giving history is, is the answer to, does that align to what you do? So if, you're not seeing any kind of past grant awards going to something that aligns to your mission and vision. It's a bad fit. So that's your easiest way to get that answer. You cannot rely on the website alone to answer that because sometimes websites aren't updated for ages and they might say that they support like saving polar bears um, childhood obesity and something else. But then when you add, and you're like, Oh, cool. Like, I saved the polar bears. This is going to be a great fit. But then when you actually go look at their funding history, you might see they don't actually make grants in that area. Why do they say they do? So that's, if there's just one tip I have for you on that, it's, it's that, and then it's not forcing it. Like, that's a big, the big thing I see. It's like, we think if we just like contort ourselves enough, we'll fit and we're, and we're, right. we give up too much of our integrity and in what we are. I do think that this process can be helpful when you do it early on, because you know, what you might need to do to be successful with the funder and you can shape your project accordingly, but it's not ch changing who you are and what you do to chase whatever grant funding you wanna go after because then what's your backbone? What do you stand for? That will be wishy-washy and it will come through in the application. 
So being strong in who you are uh, is just really critical to then making sure you can find organizations that align. I love that. That's awesome. Um, there's a there's a variety of questions that I'll kind of touch on on two subjects here. Um, okay. One is, you know, who should reach out to funders? Um, you know, should it be the grant writer or a program oh. director? Yeah. Um, and then kind of the follow up there, um, because we kind of addressed like, what's the best way to reach out to these folks with the prospectus and all these other things. Um, but who should reach out? To the like who from the org should reach out to these funders and then what happens when you reach out and they just don't reply to you such a good question okay this ties in really well to the last point i was going to talk about in the funding funnel so i'm going to bring this full circle and then you can hit me with more questions but okay my brain just went totally blank <laughs> <laughs> what? It's, it's beautiful so who should reach out like from the from oh. the org should it be yeah, a, okay got it outreach? sorry thank you i was yeah. just like wow what are, <laughs> what just happened like that happens to everyone public speaking like even if you do it a lot <laughs> yeah that's, okay. that's why we have pregnant pauses we're just like oh my gosh right yeah i'm like not contemplating i'm just literally blanking <laughs> okay um so who should reach out does depend a little bit on the funder that you are pursuing I have found that when you are reaching out to a foundation, it really needs to come from within the organization because they wanna have trust with that organization's staff and capacity. So in that situation, the grant writer, if you are an external grant writer, you can certainly be alongside in that process, help schedule it, participate, but that executive director or director or whatever needs to be on every one of those calls and building that relationship. If you are working on like a federal grant where that or person you're communicating with isn't deciding if your grant is successful or not, I have found that as an external grant writer, there's no problem for me to communicate with them directly to get questions answered. And it doesn't negatively affect the client. I will, of course, bring in that client when I think it's really important and pertinent and strategic. But a lot of the times it's just I need to go get these answers. They're going to give them to me and I can bring them back and we move faster. So the answer does depend a little bit on the funder source. Um, but when in doubt, just both hit it together and you're welcome to schedule them. Awesome. And what, like uh, any additional tips on like, you know, when they just really oh, don't, get, reaching don't out. get back to you and yeah. like, just, yeah. He's like hitting a stone wall, you know? Oh yeah, oh yeah, okay, for sure. So first of all, everybody's inundated with email all the time. So one email is insufficient and just know that and you have to ask at least three times. Like end of story, ask three times to connect with someone. That's just the benchmark that we're all agreeing to work from. That said, what if you re email, call, do everything in your, you know, humanly possible and no one's getting back to you? I have a story about this. So the last part of the funding research funnel is confirming eligibility, that you as an applicant are eligible and that what you wanna get funded is eligible. And it doesn't seem like it should be rocket science, but it can sometimes be rocket science. So I was brought into a grant application. There was actually already a team working on it, but they needed an additional grant writer. And so I came in a little late in the process and I was not convinced reading the funding guidelines that this applicant was eligible. It was for this small water hydroelectric project in Northeast Alaska. And the grant source was a federal grant with the Department of Interior. So I am calling every name and emailing every email in the entire 80 page funding announcement and no one is getting back to me. I cannot confirm the applicant is eligible. So I raise the red flag. Mind you, I am 25. So I feel like, why am I the newbie that's kind of freaking out about this and no one else seems to care? So I really undermined my own confidence on it. And I was like, okay, at some point, I guess if they're not worried, I shouldn't be worried, even though I see a lot of red flags. And I was eventually sent back this like legal mumbo jumbo language of like, basically <laughs> here it is, figure it out. And I, I just had to proceed. So proceeded worked super duper hard. Um, I was actually called out onto a surveying crew because they were short staff. So I'm like out surveying from 4 a.m. to like 5 p.m. coming back home and then working on this grant. 
and I go mountain biking that weekend. And I just like was so wiped and so exhausted. I wrecked and I broke my collarbone. And because I'm crazy, I was like, I'm still going to get this grant in. So in between like pain medication and surgery with four days left to go, I do finish this grant do on my birthday. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, this whole thing. And what do you know? Everyone can probably guess the outcome. We get a letter a couple months later saying you are not eligible. So therefore we're not further considered, which was obviously decimate, like just very, um, you know, crushed me for multiple reasons. Right. Yeah. Because, and, it, and it's now why I just, I teach this process. I don't want people to lose three weeks of their lives to nothing. Mm -hmm. So it just, it really does matter. If you're not hearing from an organization that's red flag, frankly, they go to the bottom of the list and you need to focus on other grants. That's the quick answer. It's beautiful. I love it. And you're very hardcore. It's, uh, it's <laughs> bonkers. Um, so <laughs> I think, you know, there, there seems to be a lot of, um, a lot of other, um, questions floating around. Um, you know, I, there's a couple questions about just kind of the, the process of actually identifying that contact person within the organization. Like, how do you actually figure out who to talk to? And on the public sector side, um, a lot of that is public information and, and you can simply like search around the website and find it. It takes, it takes some diligence. Um, you know, one of the things we're building in Open Grants will be live shortly is, is a tool that will actually have that contact information right with the grant. It's frequently published with the RFP. It's just usually buried in pages and pages of legal and, and bureaucratic jargon. Um, I wish there was an easier answer on the public side, but um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the foundation side, because I know foundations are frequently like uh, the government in one sense, because they tend to be a little bureaucratic, especially the big ones. Um, how do you, how do you figure out like the right people to talk to, especially if you don't like you're coming in cold. So like, how do you, what's the, can you speak a bit to that process? Yeah. I mean, I think the quick answer is just online. There is a contact information somewhere. So chase it down and don't be afraid. And even if it's just a blank contact form, get in there and get up with it and don't be afraid to pick up the phone. That is also a very uh, strong power tool. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, we don't uh, we don't live in a world where we do a lot of phone calling anymore, um, and it, it does it does uh, I find frequently that it puts people on their toes. You just call up and they're like, "Well, I guess I have to engage with this person who is talking to me right now." Um, so it's a lot harder to ignore uh, than an email for sure. So yeah, unfortunately, you know, some of these questions I wish we had a magic yeah. bullet, but there's. We could there's, yeah, we could. There's so many good questions in here. I'm like, we could be here for three hours getting all of these. So maybe we'll make a point of trying to capture them all too. I know Alex is madly dashing and, and yeah. filling out responses where she can. So. Yep. Yeah. There's. Some there's of them a, I know we will answer if we just talk about like what then happens at the bottom of the funnel. Yes. So maybe we should do that. That's that's perfect. Yes, that's exactly what I was hoping to do. Let's let's dive into like this last part of the funnel. And, and then maybe we can talk a bit about how this translates into the, the strategy itself. Yeah. Okay. So when you've gotten to the bottom of the funnel and you've gone through the process that we just talked about, confirming competitiveness, talking to the grant funder, and for sure, making sure you're eligible, you will have a very clear idea of the grants that you really want to pursue. They naturally emerge. They float to the top. And so what you'll do is put that into a funding strategy, which for us means a two to three page memorandum. And it summarizes the funding research process that you went through so that everyone appreciates that while yes, you're only listing four grants, you have filtered a hundred. Your recommendations on exactly what to pursue and why your critical thinking, a timeline for the actions that need to happen and next steps. So Alex was going to drop into the chat box or maybe into one of the Q&A answers, a sample funding strategy memo, just so everyone can look at it. I know we're all a lot of visual learners in here, so you can see how we organize that content. But what's nice about it is once it's in that, that clear two to three page document, now it's time to go shop it around and make sure everyone's on board so you're not thrust into the situation of like the grants due in two weeks, go after it. And it's not yeah. anywhere in your memorandum, which is a big problem. Cool. It just got dropped into the chat box. Thanks, Alex. 
So the sample funding strategy, you can go look at it and open it up, make a copy if you want. So um, I'm actually in the process of this right now. We are working on a project for a parks and recreation, a, a huge park development. It's like a $6 million project in Valdez, Alaska. And I next week have to bring our funding strategy to the Parks and Rec Commission and then to city council because they need to put in some match and they need to buy into this and you know pay to actually pursue these grants, right? And the most useful document for facilitating that conversation is the funding strategy. So we'll fine tune it and hand it to them and they can read it and they'll totally be up to pace on what, to, what we propose and what's going on. So it's just a really nice way to get everyone on the same page and recognize also that it's a living document. It'll change. Like maybe you don't win a grant and now you got to go find another one that you want to pursue. Like, so you're, you're always working off of it, but at least it's like very simple and straightforward. That's yeah, no, I, I, you know, it's, it's really important to get, you know, a concise plan together. Um, once again, because of that intentionality and just the dividends that it yields. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit about, um, you know, what your thoughts are and just, you know, how much, um, how much time and energy should go into this. Um, if you're a, if you're a grant writer, like how much should you be charging for this approach? Um, we'd love to, uh, like, maybe let's talk about time frame first and then talk a little bit about just on the business side, like you're, you're a grant writer or you're hiring a grant writer. Um, how much should this cost? Like what, what's the real effort that goes into putting something like this together? Yeah, hundred um, percent. And also just backing up for us, scanning the Q and A, I saw a lot of people are like, but wait a minute, where do you find the grants? I'm like, okay, I guess I didn't answer that clearly. Okay. At the top of the funnel, when you're looking for hundred plus grants, there are a number of grant databases, one of which open grants has founded. So that's a great place to start and it's free there. So go to their you know website, sign up, and you can like start filtering through searches there. There's, there's a lot of different and interesting resources, basically anything, but don't just use Google, like use a structured tool or, uh, and that'll help you go through that process of seeing what's out there in a very methodical way. So just so everyone, I think we, you know, um, Sadal can talk about that as well, but just so we were clear, it's not just like finding those hundred grants out of thin air. It's like actually using a database. Okay. So back to the question, uh, it, how long does it take to put together a funding strategy? It typically takes six to eight weeks. The time consuming part is getting meetings with those funders. And that process can take a couple of weeks. By the time you're on their calendar, you've talked, you've followed up, right? So that's about what it takes. And it's, you know, an investment of time that's probably 30 hours of work for like a pretty complex funding strategy, decently complex. Um, and then in terms of what it costs, I mean, we charge eight to 12,000, which would be really more on the upper end of, of what you could expect to pay for it. We've definitely trained a small army of grant writer, grant writing unicorns that do this at sort of the intermediate level. And so their fees are anywhere from like two to $3,000, maybe two to five, right? So definitely ways to get that work done. That's more affordable and attainable. I think. Alex actually has a list on our website of some of just a handful of some of the grant writers in our program and a bunch are actually listed on your website as well. So you have a bunch of grant writers in your directory that we've trained. So um, that's, that's roughly what you can expect. And the way I like to think about it when you're thinking of what's the ROI on this, if you pursue one grant that was a waste of your time, guarantee you spent at least four thousand dollars worth of resources and time to go after it so it pays for itself by just saving you from going after one wasted grant application right and that can be a way to kind of think about what is what is this value to me does that make sense that makes perfect sense and i i think that you know that's that's a huge part of uh some of the great training that you offer as well as you know helping grant writers think about like what's the value to me or to the end user um, and how do I do that? You know, like this is the beginning of you starting to really analyze and like understand how much, how many resources and what kind of efforts you're gonna commit. Um, and it's really important. It's that, it's that foundational work. Um, I, like, I like to um, draw the analogy to software development, system and tech um, as well, where, you know, when you start building software, 
because it is so complex and it's going to be so much like so much of a resource commitment, right? You're spending 200, 250 K on development of something. Um, you, you, what you do first is you plan and you put a plan together, you scope and you develop a plan that's really yeah. detailed and very intentional because you know that, and you know that if you get to the end of your process and you've built something that is garbage, you are going to have waste. You're just going to have all this sunk cost. And that's what grant, like grant writers uh, who aren't developing and building these strategies, that's kind of what you're, you're kind of sticking yourself in that kind of situation where, you know, if you get to the end and you didn't do the planning and you didn't put together your strategy, you, you're stuck with some costs and you don't have anything to show for it. And that's a real bummer. So um, I will say that there are um, not only deeply, uh, deeply important and impactful decisions that come out of building one of these strategies, but one of the questions I saw was something about, you know, someone had mentioned that they're working with an early stage startup and they don't like, they need the startup to define more things so they can build a strategy. And that's something that is, you know, I think that that's one of the beautiful forcing functions of going after grant funding and building a strategy is you do have to get clear on what your impacts are and what you're going to be working right. on and, and how you're going to do it and what your budget is. Because if you don't, you, there's no way you're going to put together a good strategy at all. So, um, you know, that's, that's huge. Well, I want to take the last, you know, a few minutes here and uh, first and foremost, thank everyone. Um, if we couldn't get to all your questions, you, you've all asked amazing questions. If we couldn't get to them all, we are going to throw together a great doc. We'll pull together questions that were asked and we'll publish that to everyone. We'll make this recording available. Um, I wanted to, Meredith, I want to just hear from you. Like, you know, this is something that you train people on. It's one of the unique things that, that really attracted me to your program and to your company when we first met and when I was researching who was, who was building this ecosystem. Um, what talk, can you talk more about like how your program prepares people to do this and what kind of, you know, outputs and, and like expectations people might have if they decide to work with you and, and like, you know, really re either refine their skills if they're already grant writers um, and, and build out this muscle or, um, you know, going from, from zero to like getting stoked on, on work again and like addressing that burnout. Yeah. Thank you. Good questions. And I can answer that for sure. So what makes our program so cool? Well, first of all, our unicorn is, or our mascot's a unicorn. So we turn people into grant writing unicorns. That's a pretty, uh, pretty cool fact. But uh, in terms of kind of what makes us different in the our corner of the internet, there's a lot of resources for those of you that are interested in learning how to write grants, like in terms of online trainings or whatever. I mean, hands down, like one of the best like starting points would be just like go buy a $20 book. So that's a good starting point. Uh, we a year ago decided to make a very deliberate focus on serving those that want to become grant writers as a career, whether they're doing that within their organization to get a promotion or to build a freelance grant writing practice. So do recognize that that's the lens that we show and teach grant writing. So I think what differentiates us is that we show everyone how to pay for their investment in our program within three to six months because they are getting paid putting together these funding strategies that we just talked about for organizations that you know won't even blink an eye at paying for that because they're so desperate for someone to do it. And then it's a very stepstone process from there of like, how do you make your first 15K? and either land that job or grow to 50K. And from there, how to build a six figure business and from there beyond with the big team, right? So it's a very, um, it's like a year round program that helps you pull off this career transition and then stick around for the community, which is where the real magic's at. I think our people introduce themselves and I want to be their friend close friend. <laughs> and I don't know how many communities everyone listening is a part of, where you get that, where you're like, I, I felt like my career has been just, you know, kind of fragmented or I have way too many interests and I'm kind of feel weird. And then you join this community and you're like, oh my gosh, there's other people out there like me. And that's, that's something we're happy to have solved for. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, very cool. Um, let me go ahead. And I, I see there's some questions about contacting us and, and other uh, yeah. just kind of more information. Um, some questions about best ways to hire grant writers. Um, let me go ahead and and we will, um, just for those of you asking, we'll make sure to like also just email out these links that we've shared. So if you're having issues with clicking them or anything, just let, just um, rest assured that you will 
receive this information um, here in the very near future. Um, if you do want to get in touch with us, um, so just, just to kind of give a quick overview, um, there's uh, open grants. You can, you can hop on, you can find grant, grant funding, um, and you can also get connected to a marketplace of grant writers, some of which have been trained at learngrantwriting.org, um, and you can hire them there. You can also reach out to learngrantwriting.org to get connected. Um, the email is, is there in the, uh, here on the, on the slide, uh, info at synworks.org. So definitely um, reach out, take the time to get in touch. Um, I, let's spend the last uh, few minutes here. Well, let's just try to hit some of these real yeah, fast. Yeah, let's power hit them. Let's make them like super duper fast. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, okay. So um, uh, we have, um, we're gonna just start at the top here. Okay. Um, so question, um, I find grant writing easy in the public sector, but incredibly difficult to identify opportunities in the nonprofit space. Um, you know, a, a big part of the path to success is developing the strategy. And if you go to grantmakers.io, that's the best open source data on the nonprofit space in terms of grants and who's giving grants. It's very complete um, and it's free to use. So I would, I would head over there and maybe check that out. Um, great question here. Um, uh, foreign female entrepreneur, they have a great team but they need a work visa, they wanna apply for um, you know, grants from the government. Um, how, do they, how do they navigate that? Um, do, how do you understand if you're, um, if you're eligible? Um, all of that's gonna be in the RFP. So you're gonna to wanna to read through. Um, I would say that in your space in particular, if you are um, not from the United States, it's frequently hard to secure funding from the US government. But there's loads of foundations that love investing and lots of NGOs that love deploying grant funding into the international community. Um, and you may find state programs, um, you know, if you have a business nexus in a state that will also fund you. The federal government tends to require um, US citizenship um, uh, and US ownership of entities. So, um, uh, great question here. What are the best grants you've seen for for-profit social impact tech companies? Um, I don't know what your thoughts are, Meredith, but for me, um, SBIR um, is probably one of the bigger ones and BAA grants as well. Yeah, I'd agree. Um, without knowing the specifics of that project, right? A little hard yeah. to answer, but um, <laughs> that some emails and phone calls can't probably uncover. Yeah, exactly. Um, awesome. So uh, a couple others, uh, grants, uh, why are grants for small businesses hard to find? Because there's a lot more grants for other things uh, is the short answer. Um, but um, to be specific, if you want to search for SBA grants, so small business administration, um, SBA puts out a lot of grants for small businesses. That's a great place to get started. Um, you can also look for SBIR, which is the Small Business Innovation and Research Grant Program. That's the big one that um, a lot of people know, and that's the best place to go looking for that. Um, great one here for, uh, for Meredith. Um, we're on the last year of a major campaign and I was asked to provide prospectus. Um, is there a different strategy that you would use? Yeah, it would be helpful that it's where I wanna like unmute someone and ask them questions about this. Uh, utilize the same model because you need to still close the gap celebrate your progress so far in any future funding that you're pursuing. Talk about how you've deployed the funding you've already received effectively and how closing the, the last year is going to really, you know, be exponentially helpful in locking down how effective your program is. So I would still use the same process of even just going back to the drawing board and putting together your funding strategy. But yeah, be for sure to celebrate how far you've already come and you'll have no trouble closing that gap. Awesome. Um, real quick, there's a question about how to get started as a consultant and how does Open Grants work? So Open Grants is a marketplace. We actually, we hire vetted and interviewed consultants who have typically at least a little portfolio. So they've done ideally a few projects at least and showed some strong traction. Um, we have a 20% take in our marketplace um, and we have access to a ton of good leads. Uh, basically, you sign up, you can apply and you can uh, get approved. And then in terms of getting started as a consultant, if you're just going from zero, um, Meredith, you know, has talked a bit about what, what they do. But I, I'd say that, um, you know, learngrantwriting.org is, is the place to be. 
Sure is. Yeah, I think Alex just answered that possibly with the YouTube video. That's what I was going to go do. So go see how that just moved over into answered. So there should be an answer on that soon. Awesome. Um, where can you find a list of websites and tools to search for grants? Meredith. We actually have the number one ranking answer for that on Google. If you search it for it, we have a blog post about it. So if you search grant, uh, yeah, grant writing databases, that's, uh, that's a good start, that blog post. And then of course, using the open grants databases is uh, obviously a good move as well. Awesome. Um, I love this one. How can I make a strong case to show an impactful or theory of change in my project plan when I'm from a small population size versus large population countries? Yes, yeah, so it doesn't matter the size of your country, it's the size of your impact. And so I actually added, I guess not like I'm like promoting my book, but a whole nother chapter on this, um, where I had a guest speaker actually help us put this together, teaching me all about logic models and how you do put together your theory of change and track it, and then talk about that in leveraging it with your future grant applications. So I would start by reading that, and I think that'll be helpful uh, just to get you oriented that it doesn't matter that you're a small country. What matters is your specific program and the impact that you're having and how you're iterating based on what you're learning to be better and better. Beautiful. Love it. Um, next one here. Um, when you partner with a funder, does that entail equity ownership in exchange for funding? Um, I'll just go ahead and say that typically, no, if you're getting a grant, they're usually non-dilutive. If you're giving away equity, you should have your attorney look at that for sure. Um, definitely don't just do that. Um, uh, another good question here. It's always good to start early on grant research, but what if you find one with only a few weeks to the deadline? Um, yeah, I'll I just tell you one. my recommendation. Oh, go ahead. Go, Mary. Okay. Yeah. So this is something we actually run into a lot. Sometimes when people are doing grant research, they say, well, that one's due in a month. So I guess I can't do it. So I'll just take it off the list. I'm like, no, 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 no. Keep it on the list. You can apply for it next year. Right. Or like just, you still, I don't care when you're in stage one of the funnel, when the deadline is, there are certainly times in my life when I have hit things hard and pulled off an entire grant application in five days. But if I wasn't successful, I'd also have to take complete responsibility for having done that because it's a pretty tough thing to do because uh, it's not allowing you relationship building time and you can just have some blind spots because you want to proceed. So you're not necessarily seeing things clearly. But biggest thing is at least just keep it on your list and uh, you can then really tee up to apply for it next year if it still is a really good fit. Beautiful, thank you. All right, we have, um, we only have a minute left here. Um, yeah. Such great questions, um, let's see. Well, we've answered 59, not bad. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> that's kind of impressive. We, we did our best. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I really wanna share my appreciation to Meredith for jumping on this call. Um, a lot of respect for the incredible things they're doing over at learngrantwriting.org. They're enabling a lot of really amazing things to happen. So um, we uh, really appreciate everyone who attended. Thank you all. Um, we will put together some docs. We'll put out this recording and we look forward to, you know, being of service. So definitely, you know, follow the links here on the, on the slide. Come check us out. Thank you all for coming and we hope to see you in, uh, you know, future events. Yay. Thank you. That was such a blast. Power hour. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Woo. Nice work, everyone. Bye, All right. Everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody.